need a blessing, don't ask me why. Let's thank God for our youth and our youth choir. The scripture that was read this morning by Sincere Catino is where I'm preaching from this morning. It's being read from the book of Ecclesiastes, the words of the preacher, as he calls himself, in chapter 11, verse 4. For those of you that are visiting with us, I've been preaching a series, Don't Miss This Moment. This is the last sermon in the three-sermon series. From the book of Ecclesiastes, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 4. From the New Living Translation, you'll find these words. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. I'm going to say that again. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. Don't miss this moment. Sermon number three. Would you pray with me? God, we honor you. We bless you. We reverence your holy name. We thank you for this moment and space and time. And it is our prayer, God, that you would speak for us, that you would speak through us, that you would send a word, a rhema word, for someone, including myself. Can't do anything without your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, empower us for the task ahead. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. As many of you know, I was born in a rural town called Ivanhoe, North Carolina. And for us, uh, trips to Wilmington were once or twice a year. We spent most of our time on Saturdays in either Burgo or Wilmington, or excuse me, or Wallace. One of the sites that we would often frequent was not only at Piggly Wiggly and the places in Burgo, but my mom and dad would always stop off to Deed's Drugstore. In Deed's Drugstore, daddy would send me inside the store with a crisp $1 bill he would tell me, Terry, go inside and get what was called the Farmer's Almanac. Now, for you city folk, you're probably saying, what in the world is he talking about? The Almanac was a guide used for planting. Uh, it's an annual what guide that is published, and the farmers use it to watch uh, the fullness of the moon. There were certain signs and things that they would look for. And Daddy and Mama were, they followed that almanac religiously. They didn't plant anything, put any seeds in the ground, or even what we called ice potatoes, and you would put them in the ground first, and that's the first thing you harvest before you harvest anything else. They felt like, for sure, that if they followed the almanac, they would have the best planting days, the best forecast, and most of all, the full moon dates. The almanac, again, as I said before, they thought it was useful. Uh, again, they wouldn't put any plants or seeds in the ground until they consulted the almanac. They felt like it was a reliable source. They would purchase the seeds, Deaconess Homes, and they would wait for the right time to plant. Daddy would have them stacked up in the smokehouse on the shelf, and you wouldn't touch anything until he checked the almanac, and then he would break up the ground and prepare to plant the seeds. But I think if Daddy and Solomon ever get together, they're going to have conflicting interests. Daddy believed in following the almanac. Solomon said, and these words are quite profound, farmers who wait for perfect weather will never plant. If they watch every cloud, they'll never harvest. That's deep. It's deep, and because what Solomon, the wisest man on earth, I want our youth to hear this, is saying, 
there's never a wrong time to walk by faith. And we can't gauge our next step by what we see. Listen, he said, if you wait for perfect weather, you will never plant. If you watch every cloud, you will never reap the harvest. What if Dr. King had waited on the right time to advocate for civil rights? What would we have missed if, we, if he had said this is not the right time? What if Rosa Parks had relinquished her seat and even though she admitted she was exhausted and didn't want to move, but let's say she would have waited for another day, another opportunity. And what happens, Anne, if that opportunity never comes? What if Ted Beasley said, wait, now is not the time to become the next lieutenant governor of the state of North Carolina, and he decided to wait? I guarantee you there's something in him, some unction that he had that made him believe that now is the time. I preached a sermon some years ago based on John Ottberg's book. In fact, my notes, I tag every sermon. I did it in 2006. And John Ottberg has a book that I've read numerous times, Reverend Respus, and the book is entitled, If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat. <laughs> and Ottberg deals with the issues of fear. And he says that fear causes us to miss opportunities to see God's power manifest. And the uh, preface of the book, Ottberg says, there's something inside of us that tells us, I'm going to preach in a minute, that there's more to life than just sitting in the boat. You were made for so much more. Ottberg says there's something on the inside of you that wants to walk on water. But in order to walk on water, you got to leave your comfort zone. Help me, somebody. And the routine existence and abandon yourself and chase after the high adventures of God. This is a good time to ask, what has fear kept you from doing? What has fear kept you from achieving? Or what is fear keeping you from? Have you ever considered the number of persons in the Bible that God called to do things that were scary to them? Moses, who am I? that I should go against Pharaoh. Gideon, <laughs> that job's not for me. The ten spies excluded the two, Caleb and Joshua. And I believe, Russell, that that same spirit of fear is prevalent today. It involves taking a risk, and we are frightened by what we see, and we wrestle with, is it the right time? And then too many of us listen to family members and friends or so-called friends or peers who try to intimidate us and try to make us feel like, man, I don't think this is the right time. The wisest man on earth, listen to me somebody, and I'm going to preach in a minute, said, look, 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 if you wait for perfect weather, you'll never plant. And if you watch every cloud, you'll never harvest. What he's simply saying is this, if you allow Satan to intimidate you with fear so that you never step out and try to accomplish anything, then you won't sow any seed. And if you don't sow any seed, you won't reap a harvest. Reverend Adams is helping me back there. If you don't sow any seed, you won't reap a harvest. That's anywhere you're going. Fear robs us of grand opportunities that God has in store for us. And Reverend Murray, the Lord said to me when I was preparing the message that too many of us are cloud watching. That's something new, isn't it? Cloud watching. Because Reverend Caldwell, when we see the clouds, the clouds symbolize bad weather or impending storms and because of that, we sit down and we become a complacent and fearful and we decide, I'm not going to take a chance because it doesn't look like it's the right time. Can I tell you something? Monique Robinson, she's not here this morning, so I'm going to, uh, at least I don't see her. She's our WWAY news anchor here and a member of our church. But I'm, I guess I've been 
connected with WCT in France as well, and that crew for so many years. That's what I watch. And they have what's called a weather app. And prior to this last storm, knowing I was going out of town, Mrs. Henry and I, I downloaded the weather app so I can get the updates. And guess what? Even after the storm, I'm still getting daily updates. If there's anything that looks like it's going to cause us harm or looks like it's going to be uh, something that we can, uh, that we need to be on the watch for. I get that alert. Friday, I got two alerts. Storms that are in close proximity. A few weeks ago, we had the tornadoes right down at Monkey Junction. And the warning at the last minute about these impending storms. Well, guess what? If I listen to the weather alerts, I'll never accomplish anything. I'll never take a chance. Now, the weather alerts are important. They're beneficial. They, they serve a purpose. But if you are frightened by the weather alerts and you choose not to do anything, then you won't do anything because you are too busy cloud watching. I wish I had somebody to help me. The fear never goes away. You're never willing to get out of the boat. You're never willing to take a chance. You're never willing to be assertive enough to take a risk because you're cloud watching. Pastor Henry, you're going to wait till this afternoon and preach? No, I'm going to preach in a minute. <laughs> Dr. Hadding Robinson, my uh, preaching professor at Gordon Conwell in Boston, Dr. Robinson said, if you don't take a chance, you will spend the rest of your life sloping over a question, what if? What if Reverend Respa chose to just forego her plans to be a commentator? What if you hadn't taken the chance to go back to school? What if you remain on that job that you know is not going anywhere? What if you hadn't gone into the military? Think about the things, the opportunities you would have missed if you hadn't seized the moment, carpe diem, and taken advantage of the opportunity that God placed before you. Phyllis, wouldn't it be a sad commentary to say that you missed a single opportunity? Because rather than focusing on God's word and his invitation to step out into the water and walk by faith, that you spent your life watching the clouds, observing the moon, and waiting for the right time. Reverend Vickers has stepped out in the water and he's walking on the water. Reverend Murray has stepped out in the water. But yet you are clinging to the 11 who chose to stay in the boat because they see security in the boat. They see security in complacency. They see security in, I'm not taking a chance because if I take a chance, I might fail. Wow. I read an article by Sir Edmund Hillary that was in USS Magazine when I was flying out of town, who made several unsuccessful attempts to climb Mount Everest before he finally succeeded. After one attempt, the story says that he stood at the base of Mount Everest, the giant mountain, and shook his fist in the air and said, I will defeat you. He said in defiance, because you are as big as you are ever going to get. And I'm still growing. <laughs> what he was simply saying is that Mount Everest has already reached its peak. But he's saying that I walk by faith and not by sight. And because I walk by faith, my spiritual development is still in progress. Y'all not with me? The article said years later, after one failure after another, he finally, Sir Edmund Hillary, finally reached the top of Mount Everest. Can I tell you, you'll never reach Mount Everest watching clouds. You'll never walk on water listening to those who would advise you to stay in the boat. Can I tell you, Real Mary, it's complicated, but I'm going to try to tell you how to get out of a boat. Step out. 
preacher that was so complicated I didn't get that. Say it again. Step out and keep moving. Youth, how does that look in 2019? Step out and forget about your peers who are discouraging you. Step out. Take a chance. Step out. But you can't do it when you're cloud watching. Because I'm going to tell you something about clouds. Deacon S. Jones, clouds can be deceiving. I can't tell you how many days right here at this church I've been on outside and look up and say, wow. The clouds are dark and it's going to rain. And then Brett Bennett in just a few minutes, the sun is shining. I wish I had somebody to help me. But if I had focused on the clouds, I would have never accomplished anything. The wisest man on earth said, farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. And if they watch every cloud, they never reap. Wow. John Gill's commentary, and I use it quite often, says if a man gives heed to them, meaning the storm, the clouds, the weather forecast, and puts off his sowing from time to time for sake of better weather, such a man will lose his privilege to plant. So it comes down to two things, and now I'm ready to finish. Do I focus on my circumstances, or do I focus on the word? Can I see the hands of those of you who focus on your circumstances? Sometimes. Can I see the hands of those of you who focus on the word? Sometimes. The goal is to focus on the word at all times. We must never get me, hear me, allow our circumstances to be the source of our decision making. Y'all don't hear me? If you look at the way things are, God knows I wish I had somebody to help. You'll never get out of the boat. You'll never seize the movement. But if you look beyond and walk by faith and see it before you see it and go ahead and trust God that he will take you to it. Let me give you an example. I'm going to be finished in a minute. The Bible says that God told Abraham, and he did. Them because he told Abraham, first, you are going to have a son. Later, he told Abraham and Sarah they were going to have a son. In fact, on one occasion, oh, I think it's Genesis 18, if I'm not mistaken, God said, by this time next year, I wish I had somebody to help me, you and your wife are going to have a son. That's a word. That's the word from God. God said, it's going to happen. But in the meantime, Sister Teresa Jarrett, the Bible says, that Sarah considered his age, her age, and the deadness of her womb. All right, preachers, y'all act right up here. Her barrenness. Brakel, did you get it? In other words, rather than focusing on God's promise, she looked at Abraham's age. Well, can I tell you something? God knew Abraham's age. When he made the promise, God already knew. I wish I had somebody to help me what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. He also knew Abraham's. He also knew Sarah's age. And he also knew that she was unable to bear a child. So, as a result of focusing on the circumstances and not the word, Sarah came up with the suggestion. Or can I say it like I want to say it? Sarah told God, let me help you. Sarah told Hagar. And Sarah told her husband. Told her husband, you make love to Hagar. She's young and she can bear a child. And, 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 and in other words, we will be the surrogate parents. I wish I had somebody to help me. And, 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 and it will happen this way. You go ahead and do it. And guess what? He did it. Y'all don't hear me? Not knowing that when we make decisions based upon circumstances, we also got to live with the consequences. And I know nobody don't want to tell you the truth, but there's some folk right in here living with bad choices, living with consequences based on decisions that were 
flesh based and not God based. Here got the king pregnant. Y'all know the story. That Mary was a good thing in the house until the baby was born. Then the Bible says it became a dysfunctional home. So much so that one day Sarah got so upset that she told Hagar to get out of her house. I wish I had somebody to help me. And Hagar took her son Isaac and they ran into the desert. I wish I had somebody to help me. But God met her in the desert and it's in the desert that God reassured her, I'm still with you. In fact, she left there saying, now I know that God sees me. When we make decisions based upon our circumstances, then, brothers and sisters, we've got to live and deal with the consequences. Can I ask you a personal question? What are your circumstances this morning? What clouds are you watching? What is it that you are refusing to do because you want to know for sure, is this of God? Can I tell you? If we had to wait on signs to make decisions, we would never make any. If we make our decisions based upon the clouds and the weather forecast, we'll never take another step. But somebody ought to define Hebrews 11 and 1. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, now faith. Y'all didn't get that. Now faith. Y'all didn't get that. I said now faith. It's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's now faith. So if you can see it, you don't need faith. But when you can see it beyond the clouds. Pastor Annie, have you lost your mind? I hope you're going to do better than this this evening at Moe's Creek. Y'all don't hear me? And then we got to, the second thing is we got to recognize Satan's influence over our thinking. The Bible says that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Satan wants to steal your next move. Satan, Satan wants to rob you of your idea. Satan wants to steal your vision, your future, and he's tactful in doing so by getting you to shift from God's promises to your circumstances. God knows. Wouldn't it be sad, Sister Melvin, to spend your day just cloud watching? I want to do something great. But, whoa. And then I make a turn and decide, oh, sis, I can't go in that direction. I'll go in this And then there's another cloud. Y'all ought to help me here. And everywhere I look, there's a cloud, and some of them appear to be darker than what I see. And they're all designed to intimidate me, to frighten me, never to make a move. Because Satan knows if I don't sow in the seeds, I'll never reap a harvest. So consequently, Satan creates doubt. And you can call it what you want to call it. Doubt is fear. I dare him see. And fear and doubt means I don't trust God. So Satan created doubt. You want to do it. You've already heard God's endorsement. God's already given you. Are you with me? The green light. Are y'all with me? And Brother Beasley just was all over it this morning when he said, God says, write the vision and make it plain. The vision is out. You know what to do. But you won't do it because you are cloud watching. God has already told you the name of your book. You've already got the chapters outlined. You've already got it together. But you won't get started because you are fearful. Cloud watching. What are others going to say? Can I tell you what those 11 disciples said in the boat? They were African Americans. I heard that. Look at Peter. Always trying to.
do something different. You better stay as real in the boat with us. Y'all know that's how we talk. He's thinking he's better than we are. Y'all know, folks, if, if you decide to go one step higher than they are, the crabs start grabbing. Come back. Come back. We want you where we are. Jesus said, come. And Peter took that step and started working on the water. Pre Preacher, where you going? I thought you were in Ecclesiastes. I'm trying to merge the two texts to get you to see it. And let me tell you something. Peter was doing a great job. But the Bible says, when he took his eyes off of Jesus and started looking at the clouds and the rain and the wind, then, He began to sink. Yeah. Remember, because you got to analyze the text, and when you analyze it closely, you will see it. The storm didn't start when he walked out on water. The storm was already in progress. So God was saying, if I can get you out of the boat, I can keep you on the water, but you got to trust me. So preacher, as you get ready to close, how can I move from focusing on my circumstances to focusing on the word? Are y'all with me? I guess Bethany in a sense is glad she's at Virginia State University, our daughter. Because every now and then Miss Crummy, she would hear noises in the house. Y'all don't hear me? And I'm not ashamed to tell you it was her daddy. Every now and then I'll holler. You don't want to live with me. I make noises. What are you saying in the room? I remind myself of what God said. When the wind starts blowing and the howling tempest begin to rage, I just begin to speak over my situation. God, you spoke to a storm on a raging sea. And I heard you say, peace be still. And you said greater things than this shall I do because I go to my Father. So therefore, I want the same power that the disciples had to tell my storm, be still. We got to speak it. I know y'all said he's lost his mind. No, I haven't lost my mind. You got to get up with it. You got to recite it in the morning. You got to sing it when you're in the shower. You got to say it all day long. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, you got to say a resounding voice. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want him. He makes me the Lord. I wish I had somebody else. You've got to tell your storm that my God shall supply all of my needs. Now I'm going to tell you how to rephrase it. I'm going to tell you how to rephrase it. Rather than say, my God shall supply. Get on your knees and say, thank you, God, for supplying my needs. Thank you, God, for making a way out of no way. Thank you, God, for opening up another door. Thank you, God, for showing up and showing up. Does anyone in here know what today's date is? What is it? Y'all must don't know what the day is. Then I dare somebody to declare in your spirit, as of today's day, I'm no longer going to cloud watch and focus on my circumstances. I wish I had somebody that will say it. I decree and declare that as of September 22nd, 2019, I'm no longer going to cloud watch, but rather than cloud watch, I'm going to believe that it shall be like God said. If God said, I am the head and not the tail, I am the head. If God says, I'm above and not beneath, I am above. If God said, I shall be the lender and not the borrower. 
I am the lender. I refuse to watch clouds anymore. I refuse to hang out with folk that are watching clouds. The wisest man on earth said farmers who wait for perfect weather never plan. Wow. If they watch every cloud, Brother Brown, they'll never harvest. And let me tell you what's complicated. I'm not talking about my home, thank God, but somebody's there. What do you deal when you live with one person who walks by faith? And another person who cloud watches. I'm going to tell you how to do it. Reverend, Reverend said that's a rough life. Tough circumstances. Get you some oil. Pray over it. And where he or she sleeps, put crosses on the pillow. Y'all don't hear me? Put them in their shoes. Point of contact. Everywhere the person abides, let it be in their presence. So much so you start to witness something is happening. That person that was cloud watching is now becoming a believer. Because God can do all things, and he can turn any situation. You will never achieve what God has preordained that you would achieve. Cloud watch. Let me put my glasses on, because I... Brother Mary, come here. I, I know you're my brother in Christ, but the Lord told me to tell you. Don't you make that next step now. It might leave you broke. And you might lose everything. Brother Mary, you know I'm your brother, bro. And I wouldn't tell you anything wrong. Yes, I just told you something wrong. Because anything that is contrary to the word of God is not of God. And a lot of folk hide behind. The Lord told me to tell you. Well, I talked to him this morning. Why didn't he tell me? agree that there are individuals that he'll send. But get this, to confirm what God has already spoken to you. And that serves as a confirmation. The wisest man on earth, I'm closing, said he who waits for perfect weather never plant. You got seeds that will die, or rot, or waste away, because you never put them in the ground. God knows there's so much potential in one seed, but they won't do anything if you hold them in your hand. You got to put them in the ground. A story in preaching today that I found and I held on to, and Lord knows, I said, God, I can close with this today. The woman who complained about everything, nothing was ever right. She felt like the world was unfair, that the world was falling apart, and she just spent her life sitting home. She was a couch potato, depressed. And one day she heard a voice say, get out of here. Go for a walk. And the story says she went to the mall and decided to go into the first store that she saw. When she walked in the mall, she said, oh, my God, that man looks just like Jesus. She looked again, Phyllis, and she looked again, and she said, that is Jesus. She 
she looked at him again and she said, I'm going to ask you, are you Jesus? He said, yes, I am. She said, do you work here? He said, no, ma'am, I don't. I own the store. He said, come in and just walk around. She says, you've got everything an individual will want in this store. He said, look around and make a list of whatever you want, whatever you see. She says, I see everything I need in this store. She made a list. She made a list of nine things that she wanted. And he said, now, when you get your list together, come back to the counter, and we're going to talk about how you can get there. She went back to the counter, and she thought sure that he was going to hand her those things. And he reached down under the cabinet, under the counter, and handed her nine packs of seeds. And she said, Jesus, I thought you were going to give me the things that I wanted. He said, I just did. He said, you plant, I'll give the increase, and you'll reap the benefit. Y'all missed it. I've given you what you need. I've placed within you what you need. Chad Beasley didn't get everything he needed from Harvard University, one of the finest institutions in the United States of America, or at Georgetown. What Chad Beasley needed was already in him. He just needed to be pushed, inspired, and motivated to obtain the prize. The wisest man on earth says, mm. farmers who wait for perfect weather will never plant. And if they watch every cloud, they'll never reap a harvest. So Satan has said, don't do it. Don't make a fool out of yourself. Don't take a risk. Because if you do, you'll plant something. And if you plant something, you'll reap something. But if you don't plant anything because of fear, then you'll never reap anything. Don't miss this moment. God says it's already before you. He says, I'm waiting to give it to you. Just don't let fear keep it from coming to fruition. Preacher, I'm here this morning, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid because the 11 are clinging to me and they've got me in a huddle. They want me to stay where it's safe. They don't want me to take a chance. They don't want me to do anything by faith. But I hear you calling me saying, come. Come walk on the water. Come experience this new thing that I have for you. But you got to get your feet wet. You got to step out. You got to plant. You got to put your plants and your seeds in the ground. As we stand all over the house, preacher, I thought you were going to hit a home run today. It's all defined, it's all defined on how, what you call a home run. Fear. 